History of England Chapter 9, Part 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England From the Accession of James II By Thomas Babington Macaulay Chapter 9, Part 8 while James was thus raising against himself all those national feelings which, but for his own folly, might have saved his throne, Lewis was in another way exerting himself not less effectually to facilitate the enterprise which William meditated. The party in Holland which was favourable to France was a minority, but a minority strong enough according to the constitution of the Batavian Federation, to prevent the stadtholder from striking any great blow. To keep that minority steady was an object to which, if the court of Versailles had been wise, every other object would, at that conjuncture, have been postponed. Lewis, however, had, during some time, laboured as if of set purpose, to estrange his Dutch friends, and he at length, though not without difficulty, succeeded in forcing them to become his enemies at the precise moment at which their help would have been invaluable to him. There were two subjects on which the people of the United Provinces were peculiarly sensitive, religion and trade, and both their religion and their trade the French king assailed. The persecution of the Huguenots and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes had everywhere moved the grief and indignation of Protestants. But in Holland these feelings were stronger than in any other country. For many persons of Dutch birth, confiding in the repeated and solemn declarations of Lewis that the toleration granted by his grandfather should be maintained, had for commercial purposes settled in France, and a large proportion of the settlers had been naturalised there. Every post now brought to Holland the tidings that these persons were treated with extreme rigour on account of their religion. Dragoons, it was reported, were quartered on one. Another had been held naked before a fire till he was half roasted. All were forbidden, under the severest penalties, to celebrate the rites of their religion, or to quit the country into which they had, under false pretenses, been decoyed. The partisans of the House of Orange exclaimed against the cruelty and perfidy of the tyrant. The opposition was abashed and dispirited. Even the town council of Amsterdam, though strongly attached to the French interest and to the Armenian theology, had though little inclined to find fault with Lewis or to sympathise with the Calvinists whom he persecuted, could not venture to oppose itself to the general sentiment. For in that great city there was scarcely one wealthy merchant who had not some kinsman or friend among the sufferers. Petitions numerously and respectably signed were presented to the burgomasters, imploring them to make strong representations to Ava. There were even suppliants who made their way into the stadhouse, flung themselves on their knees, described with tears and sobs the lamentable condition of those whom they most loved, and besought the intercession of the magistrates. The pulpits resounded with invectives and lamentations. The press poured forth heart-rending narratives and stirring exhortations. Avo saw the whole danger. He reported to his court that even the well-intentioned, for so he always called the enemies of the House of Orange, either partook of the public feeling or were overawed by it and he suggested the policy of making some concession to their wishes. The answers which he received from Versailles were cold and acriminous. 
some Dutch families, indeed, which had not been naturalized in France, were permitted to return to their country. But to those natives of Holland who had obtained letters of naturalization, Lewis refused all indulgence. No power on earth, he said, should interfere between him and his subjects. These people had chosen to become his subjects, and how he treated them was a matter with which no neighboring state had anything to do. The magistrates of Amsterdam naturally resented the scornful ingratitude of the potentate, whom they had strenuously and unscrupulously served against the general sense of their own countrymen. Soon followed another provocation which they felt even more keenly. Lewis began to make war on their trade. He first put forth an edict prohibiting the importation of herrings into his dominions. Abbe hastened to inform his court that this step had excited great alarm and indignation, that sixty thousand persons in the United Provinces subsisted by the herring fishery, and that some strong measure of retaliation would probably be adopted by the states. The answer which he received was that the king was determined not only to persist, but also to increase the duties on many of those articles in which Holland carried on a lucrative trade with France. The consequence of these errors errors committed in defiance of repeated warnings, and, as it should seem, in the mere wantonness of self-will, was that now, when the voice of a single powerful member of the Batavian Federation might have averted an event fatal to all the politics of Lewis, no such voice was raised. The envoy, with all his skill, vainly endeavoured to rally the party by the help of which he had, during several years, held the stadtholder in check. The arrogance and obstinacy of the master counteracted all the efforts of the servant. At length, Avu was compelled to send to Versailles the alarming tidings that no reliance could be placed on Amsterdam. So long devoted to the French cause, that some of the well-intentioned were alarmed for their religion, and that the few whose inclinations were unchanged could not venture to utter what they thought. The fervid eloquence of preachers who declaimed against the horrors of the French persecution, and the lamentations of bankrupts who ascribed their ruin to the French decrees, had wrought up the people to such a temper that no citizen could declare himself favourable to France without imminent risk of being flung into the nearest canal. Men remembered that, only fifteen years before, the most illustrious chief of the party adverse to the House of Orange had been torn to pieces by an infuriated mob in the very precinct of the Palace of the States General. A similar fate might not improbably befall those who should. At this crisis, he accused of serving the purposes of France against their native land, and against the reformed religion. While Lewis was thus forcing his friends in Holland to become, or to pretend to become, his enemies, he was laboring with not less success to remove all the scruples which might have prevented the Roman Catholic princes of the continent from countenancing William's designs. A new quarrel had arisen between the court of Versailles and the Vatican, a quarrel in which the injustice and insolence of the French king were perhaps more offensively displayed than in any other transaction of his reign. It had been the rule at Rome that no officer of justice or finance could enter the dwelling inhabited by the minister who represented a Catholic state. In process of time not only the dwelling, but a large precinct round it, was held inviolable. It was a point of honour with every ambassador 
to extend as widely as possible the limits of the region which was under his protection. At length half the city consisted of privileged districts, within which the papal government had no more power than within the Louvre or the Exquirial. Every asylum was thronged with contraband traders, fraudulent bankrupts, thieves, and assassins. In every asylum were collected magazines of stolen or smuggled goods. From every asylum ruffians sallied forth nightly to plunder and stab. In no town of Christendom, consequently, was law so impotent and wickedness so audacious as in the ancient capital of religion and civilization. On this subject Innocent felt as become a priest and a prince. He declared that he would receive no ambassador who insisted on a right so destructive of order and morality. There was at first much murmuring, but his resolution was so evidently just that all governments but one speedily acquiesced. The emperor, highest in rank among Christian monarchs, the Spanish court, distinguished among all courts by sensitiveness and pertinency on points of etiquette, renounced the odious privilege. Louis alone was impracticable. What other sovereigns might choose to do, he said, was nothing to him. He therefore sent a mission to Rome, escorted by a great force of cavalry and infantry. The ambassador marched to his palace as a general marches in triumph through a conquered town. The house was strongly guarded. Round the limits of the protected district, sentinels paced the rounds day and night, as on the walls of a fortress. The Pope was unmoved. They trust, he cried, in chariots and in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He betook him vigorously to his spiritual weapons, and laid the region garrison by the French under an interdict. This dispute was at the height when another dispute arose, in which the Germanic body was as deeply concerned as the Pope. Cologne and the surrounding district were governed by an archbishop, who was an elector of the empire. The right of choosing this great prelate belonged, under certain limitations, to the chapter of the cathedral. The archbishop was also bishop of Lage, of Munster, and of Hindlesham. His dominions were extensive, and included several strong fortresses, which in event of a campaign on the Rhine would be of the highest importance. In time of war he could bring 20,000 men into the field. Lewis had spared no effort to gain so valuable an ally, and had succeeded so well that Cologne had been almost separated from Germany, and had become an outwork of France. Many ecclesiastics devoted to the court of Versailles had been brought into the chapter, and Cardinal Furstenberg, a mere creature of that court, had been appointed cogitor. End of Part 8、History、of England, Chapter 9, Part 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter Nine, Part Nine. In the summer of the year 1688, the archbishopric became vacant. Furstenberg was the candidate of the House of Bourbon. The enemies of that house proposed the young Prince Clement of Bavaria. Furstenberg was already a bishop. And therefore could not be moved to another diocese except by a special dispensation from the Pope, or by a postulation, in which it was necessary that two thirds of the chapter of Cologne should join. The Pope would grant no dispensation to a creature of France.
the emperor induced more than a third part of the chapter to vote for the Bavarian prince. Meanwhile, in the chapters of Liège, Munster, and Hildesheim, the majority was adverse to France. Louis saw, with indignation and alarm, that an extensive province which he had begun to regard as a fief of his crown was about to become not merely independent of him, but hostile to him. In a paper written with great acrimony, he complained of the injustice with which France was on all occasions treated by that sea which ought to extend a parental protection to every part of Christendom. Many signs indicated his fixed resolution to support the pretensions of his candidate by arms against the Pope and the Pope's confederates. Thus Louis, by two opposite errors, raised against himself at once the resentment of both the religious parties between which Western Europe was divided. Having alienated one great section of Christendom by persecuting the Huguenots, he alienated another by insulting the Holy See. These faults he committed at a conjuncture at which no fault could be committed with impunity, and under the eye of an opponent second in vigilance, sagacity, and energy to no statesman whose memory history has preserved. William saw with stern delight his adversaries toiling to clear away obstacle after obstacle from his path. While they raised against themselves the enmity of all sects, he labored to conciliate all. The great design which he meditated he with exquisite skill presented to different governments in different lights, and it must be added that, though those lights were different, none of them was false. He called on the princes of northern Germany to rally round him in defense of the common cause of all reformed churches. He set before the two heads of the House of Austria the danger with which they were threatened by French ambition, and the necessity of rescuing England from vassalage, and of uniting her to the European Confederacy. He disclaimed, and with truth, all bigotry. The real enemy, he said, of the British Roman Catholics was that short-sighted and headstrong monarch who, when he might easily have obtained for them a legal toleration, had trampled on law, liberty, property, in order to raise them to an odious and precarious ascendancy. If the misgovernment of Janes were suffered to continue, it must produce at no remote time a popular outbreak, which might be followed by a barbarous persecution of the Papists. The Prince declared that to avert the horrors of such a persecution was one of his chief objects. If he succeeded in his design, he would use the power which he must then possess as head of the Protestant interest to protect the members of the Church of Rome. Perhaps the passions excited by the tyranny of James might make it impossible to efface the penal laws from the statute book, but those laws should be mitigated by a lenient administration. No class would really gain more by the proposed expedition than those peaceable and unambitious Roman Catholics who merely wished to follow their callings and to worship their Maker without molestation. The only losers would be the Turconnels, the Dovers, the Albavilles, and the other political adventurers who, in return for flattery and evil counsel, had obtained from their credulous master governments, regiments, and embassies. While William exerted himself to enlist on his side the sympathies both of Protestants and of Roman Catholics, he exerted himself with not less vigor and prudence to provide the military means which his undertaking required. He could not make a descent on England without the sanction of the United Provinces. If he asked for that sanction before his design was ripe for execution, his intentions might possibly be thwarted by the faction hostile to his house, and would certainly be divulged to the whole world. He therefore determined to make his preparations with all speed, and, when they were complete, to seize some favorable moment for requesting the consent of the Federation. It was observed by the agents of France that he was more busy than they had ever known him. Not a day passed on which he was not seen spurring from his villa to the Hague. He was perpetually closeted with his most distinguished adherents. Twenty-four ships of war were fitted out for sea in addition to the ordinary force which the Commonwealth maintained. There was, as it chanced, an excellent pretense for making this addition to the marine, for some Algerine corsairs had recently dared to show themselves in the German Ocean. A camp was formed near Nimwegen. Many thousands of troops were assembled there. In order to strengthen this army, the garrisons were withdrawn from the strongholds in Dutch Brabant. Even the renowned fortress of Burgopsum was left almost defenseless. Field pieces, bombs, and tumbrils from all the magazines of the United Provinces were collected at the headquarters. 
All the bakers of Rotterdam toiled day and night to make biscuit. All the gunmakers of Utrecht were found too few to execute the orders for pistols and muskets. All the settlers of Amsterdam were hard at work on harness and bolsters. Six thousand sailors were added to the naval establishment. Seven thousand new soldiers were raised. They could not, indeed, be formally enlisted without the sanction of the Federation, but they were well drilled, and kept in such a state of discipline that they might without difficulty be distributed into regiments within twenty-four hours after that sanction should be obtained. These preparations required ready money, but William had, by strict economy, laid up against a great emergency a treasure amounting to about two hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling. What more was wanting was supplied by the zeal of his partisans. Great quantities of gold, not less, it was said, than a hundred thousand guineas, came to him from England. The Huguenots, who had carried with them into exile large quantities of the precious metals, were eager to lend him all that they possessed, for they fondly hoped that, if he succeeded, they should be restored to the country of their birth, and they feared that, if he failed, they should scarcely be safe even in the country of their adoption. Through the latter part of July and the whole of August, the preparations went on rapidly, yet too slowly for the vehement spirit of William. Meanwhile the intercourse between England and Holland was active. The ordinary modes of conveying intelligence and passengers were no longer thought safe. A light bark of marvellous speed constantly ran backward and forward between Scheveningen and the eastern coast of our island. By this vessel William received a succession of letters from persons of high note in the church, the state, and the army. Two of the seven prelates who had signed the memorable petition, Lloyd, Bishop of St. Asaph, and Trelawney, Bishop of Bristol, had, during their residence in the Tower, reconsidered the doctrine of non-resistance, and were ready to welcome an armed deliverer. A brother of the Bishop of Bristol, Colonel Charles Trelawney, who commanded one of the Tangier regiments, now known as the Fourth of the Line, signified his readiness to draw his sword for the Protestant religion. Similar assurances arrived from the savage Kirk. Churchill, in a letter written with a certain elevation of language, which was the sure mark that he was going to commit a baseness, declared that he was determined to perform his duty to heaven and to his country, and that he put his honour absolutely into the hands of the Prince of Orange. William doubtless read these words with one of those bitter and cynical smiles which gave his face its least pleasing expression. It was not his business to take care of the honour of other men, nor had the most rigid casuists pronounced it unlawful in a general to invite, to use, and to reward the services of deserters whom he could not but despise. Churchill's letter was brought by Sidney, whose situation in England had become hazardous, and who, having taken many precautions to hide his track, had passed over to Holland about the middle of August. About the same time, Shrewsbury and Edward Russell crossed the German Ocean in a boat which they had hired with great secrecy, and appeared at the Hague. Shrewsbury brought with him twelve thousand pounds, which he had raised by a mortgage on his estates, and which he lodged in the Bank of Amsterdam. Devonshire, Danby, and Lumley remained in England, where they undertook to rise in arms as soon as the Prince should set foot on the island. There is reason to believe that at this conjuncture William first received assurances of support from a very different quarter. The history of Sunderland's intrigues is covered with an obscurity which it is not probable that any inquirer will ever succeed in penetrating. But, though it is impossible to discover the whole truth, it is easy to detect some palpable fictions. The Jacobites, for obvious reasons, affirmed that the revolution of 1688 was the result of a plot concerted long before. Sunderland they represented as the chief conspirator. He had, they averred, in pursuance of his great design, incited his too confiding master to dispense with statutes, to create an illegal tribunal, to confiscate freehold property, and to send the fathers of the established church to a prison. This romance rests on no evidence, and though it has been repeated down to our own time, seems hardly to deserve confutation. No fact is more certain than that Sunderland opposed some of the most imprudent steps which James took, and in particular the prosecution of the bishops, which really brought on the decisive crisis. But even if this fact were not established, 
there would still remain one argument sufficient to decide the controversy. What conceivable motive had Sunderland to wish for a revolution? Under the existing system he was at the height of dignity and prosperity. As President of the Council he took precedence of the whole temporal peerage. As Principal Secretary of State he was the most active and powerful member of the Cabinet. He might look forward to a dukedom. He had obtained the garter lately worn by the brilliant and versatile Buckingham, who, having squandered away a princely fortune and a vigorous intellect, had sunk into the grave deserted, contemned, and broken-hearted. Money, which Sunderland valued more than honours, poured in upon him in such abundance that, with ordinary management, he might hope to become in a few years one of the wealthiest subjects in Europe. The direct emolument of his posts, though considerable, was a very small part of what he received. From France alone he drew a regular stipend of near six thousand pounds a year, besides large occasional gratuities. He had bargained with Tyrconnell for five thousand a year, or fifty thousand pounds down, from Ireland. What sums he made by selling places, titles, and pardons can only be conjectured, but must have been enormous. James seemed to take a pleasure in loading with wealth one whom he regarded as his own convert. All fines, all forfeitures, went to Sunderland. On every grant toll was paid to him. If any suitor ventured to ask any favour directly from the king, the answer was, Have you spoken to my Lord President? One bold man ventured to say that the Lord President got all the money of the court. Well, replied His Majesty, he deserves it all. We shall scarcely overrate the amount of the minister's gains if we put them at thirty thousand pounds a year, and it must be remembered that fortunes of thirty thousand pounds a year were in his time rarer than fortunes of a hundred thousand pounds a year now are. It is probable that there was then not one peer of the realm whose private income equaled Sunderland's official income. What chance was there? that, in a new order of things, a man so deeply implicated in illegal and unpopular acts, a member of the High Commission, a renegade whom the multitude in places of general resort pursued with the cry of Popish Dog, would be greater and richer. What chance that he would even be able to escape condign punishment? He had undoubtedly been long in the habit of looking forward to the time when William and Mary might be, in the ordinary course of nature and law, at the head of the English government, and had probably attempted to make for himself an interest in their favour by promises and services which, if discovered, would not have raised his credit at Whitehall. But it may with confidence be affirmed that he had no wish to see them raised to power by a revolution, and that he did not at all foresee such a revolution when, towards the close of June 1688, he solemnly joined the communion of the Church of Rome. Scarcely, however, had he, by that inexpiable crime, made himself an object of hatred and contempt to the whole nation, when he learned that the civil and ecclesiastical polity of England would shortly be vindicated by foreign and domestic arms. From that moment all his plans seemed to have undergone a change. Fear bowed down his whole soul, and was so written in his face that all who saw him could read. It could hardly be doubted that, if there were a revolution, the evil counsellors who surrounded the throne would be called to a strict account, and among those counsellors he stood in the foremost rank. The loss of his places, his salaries, his pensions, was the least that he had to dread. His patrimonial mansion, amid woods at Althorpe, might be confiscated. He might lie many years in a prison. He might end his days in a foreign land, a pensioner on the bounty of France. Even this was not the worst. Visions of an innumerable crowd covering Tower Hill, and shouting with savage joy at the sight of the apostate, of a scaffold hung with black, of Burnet reading the prayer for the departing, and of Ketch leading on the axe with which Russell and Monmouth had been mangled in so butcherly a fashion, began to haunt the unhappy statesman. There was yet one way in which he might escape, a way more terrible to a noble spirit than a prison or a scaffold. He might still, by a well-timed and useful treason, earn his pardon from the foes of the government. It was in his power to render to them at this conjuncture services beyond all price, 
for he had the royal ear, he had great influence over the Jesuitical cabal, and he was blindly trusted by the French ambassador. A channel of communication was not wanting, a channel worthy of the purpose which it was to serve. The Countess of Sunderland was an artful woman, who, under a show of devotion which imposed on some grave men, carried on with great activity both amorous and political intrigues. The handsome and dissolute Henry Sidney had long been her favourite lover. Her husband was well pleased to see her thus connected with the court of the Hague. Whenever he wished to transmit a secret message to Holland, he spoke to his wife. She wrote to Sidney, and Sidney communicated her letter to William. One of her communications was intercepted and carried to James. She vehemently protested that it was a forgery. Her husband, with characteristic ingenuity, defended himself by representing that it was quite impossible for any man to be so base as to do what he was in the habit of doing. "'Even if this is Lady Sunderland's hand,' he said, "'that is no affair of mine. Your Majesty knows my domestic misfortunes. The footing on which my wife and Mr. Sidney are is but too public.' Who can believe that I would make a confidant of the man who has injured my honour in the tenderest point, of the man whom, of all others, I ought most to hate? This defence was thought satisfactory, and secret intelligence was still transmitted, from the whittle to the adulteress, from the adulteress to the gallant, and from the gallant to the enemies of James. It is highly probable that the first decisive assurances of Sunderland's support were conveyed orally by Sidney to William about the middle of August. It is certain that, from that time till the expedition was ready to sail, a most significant correspondence was kept up between the Countess and her lover. A few of her letters, partly written in cipher, are still extant. They contain professions of goodwill and promises of service mingled with earnest entreaties for protection. The writer intimates that her husband will do all that his friends at the Hague can wish. She supposes that it will be necessary for him to go into temporary exile, but she hopes that his banishment will not be perpetual, and that his patrimonial estate will be spared. And she earnestly begs to be informed in what place it will be best for him to take refuge, till the first fury of the storm is over. The help of Sunderland was most welcome, for as the time of striking the great blow drew near, the anxiety of William became intense. From common eyes his feelings were concealed by the icy tranquillity of his demeanour. But his whole heart was open to Bentick. The preparations were not quite complete. The design was already suspected, and could not long be concealed. The King of France or the city of Amsterdam might still frustrate the whole plan. If Louis were to send a great force into Brabant, if the faction which hated the Stadtholder were to raise its head, all was over. My sufferings, my disquiet, the prince wrote, are dreadful. I hardly see my way. Never in my life did I so much feel the need of God's guidance. Bentick's wife was at this time dangerously ill, and both the friends were painfully anxious about her. God support you, William wrote, and enable you to bear your part in a work on which, as far as human beings can see, the welfare of his church depends. End of part nine. History of England, Chapter Nine, Part Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. CHAPTER Nine, PART Ten. It was, indeed, impossible that a design so vast as that which had been formed against the King of England should remain during many weeks a secret. No art could prevent intelligent men from perceiving that William was making great military and naval preparations, and from suspecting the object with which these preparations were made. Early in August hints that some great event was approaching were whispered up and down London. The weak and corrupt Albeville was then on a visit to England, and was, or affected to be, certain that the Dutch government entertained no design unfriendly to James. But during the absence of Albeville from his post, Avaux performed with eminent skill the duties both of French and English ambassador to the States, and supplied Berlion, as well as Louis, with ample intelligence, 
Avaux was satisfied that a descent on England was in contemplation, and succeeded in convincing his master of the truth. Every courier who arrived at Westminster, either from The Hague or from Versailles, brought earnest warnings. But James was under a delusion which appears to have been artfully encouraged by Sunderland. The Prince of Orange, said the cunning minister, would never dare to engage in an expedition beyond sea, leaving Holland defenceless. The States, remembering what they had suffered and what they had been in danger of suffering during the great agony of 1672, would never incur the risk of again seeing an invading army encamped on the plain between Utrecht and Amsterdam. There was doubtless much discontent in England, but the interval was immense between discontent and rebellion. Men of rank and fortune were not disposed lightly to hazard their honours, their estates, and their lives. How many eminent Whigs had held high language when Monmouth was in the Netherlands? And yet, when he set up his standard, what eminent Whig had joined it? It was easy to understand why Lewis affected to give credit to these idle rumours. He doubtless hoped to frighten the King of England into taking the French side in the dispute about Cologne. By such reasoning James was easily lulled into stupid security. The alarm and indignation of Lewis increased daily. The style of his letters became sharp and vehement. He could not understand, he wrote, this lethargy on the eve of a terrible crisis. Was the king bewitched? Were his ministers blind? Was it possible that no one at Whitehall was aware of what was passing in England and on the continent? Such foolhardy security could scarcely be the effect of mere improvidence. There must be foul play. James was evidently in bad hands. Barillon was earnestly cautioned not to repose implicit confidence in the English ministers, but he was cautioned in vain. On him, as on James, Sunderland had cast a spell which no exhortation could break. Louis bestirred himself vigorously. Bon Repos, who was far superior to Barillon in shrewdness, and who had always disliked and distrusted Sunderland, was dispatched to London with an offer of naval assistance. Avaux was at the same time ordered to declare to the States-General that France had taken James under her protection. A large body of troops was held in readiness to march towards the Dutch frontier. This bold attempt to save the infatuated tyrant in his own despite was made with the full concurrence of Skelton, who was now envoy from England to the court of Versailles. Avaux, in conformity with his instructions, demanded an audience of the States. It was readily granted. The assembly was unusually large. The general belief was that some overture respecting commerce was about to be made, and the President brought a written answer framed on that supposition. As soon as Avaux began to disclose his errand, signs of uneasiness were discernible. Those who were believed to enjoy the confidence of the Prince of Orange cast down their eyes. The agitation became great when the envoy announced that his master was strictly bound by the ties of friendship and alliance to his Britannic Majesty, and that any attack on England would be considered as a declaration of war against France. The President, completely taken by surprise, stammered out a few evasive phrases, and the conference terminated. It was at the same time notified to the States that Louis had taken under his protection Cardinal Furstenberg and the Chapter of Cologne. The deputies were in great agitation. Some recommended caution and delay. Others breathed nothing but war. Fagel spoke vehemently of the French insolence, and implored his brethren not to be daunted by threats. The proper answer to such a communication, he said, was to levy more soldiers, and to equip more ships. A courier was instantly dispatched to recall William from Minden, where he was holding a consultation of high moment with the elector of Brandenburg. But there was no cause for alarm. James was bent on ruining himself, and every attempt to stop him only made him rush more eagerly to his doom. When his throne was secure, when his people were submissive, when the most obsequious of parliaments was eager to anticipate all his reasonable wishes, when foreign kingdoms and commonwealths paid emulous court to him, when it depended only on himself whether he would be the arbiter of Christendom, he had stooped to be the slave and hireling of France. And now, when by a series of crimes and follies he had succeeded in alienating his neighbours, his subjects, his soldiers, his sailors, his children, and had left himself no refuge but the protection of France, he was taken with a fit of pride, and determined to assert his independence. 
That help which, when he did not want it, he had accepted with ignominious tears, he now, when it was indispensable to him, threw contemptuously away. Having been abject, when he might, with propriety, have been punctilious in maintaining his dignity, he became ungratefully haughty at a moment when haughtiness must bring on him at once derision and ruin. He resented the friendly intervention which might have saved him. Was ever king so used? Was he a child, or an idiot, that others must think for him? Was he a petty prince, a cardinal Furstenberg, who must fall, if not upheld, by a powerful patron? Was he to be degraded in the estimation of all Europe by an ostentatious patronage which he had never asked? Skelton was recalled to answer for his conduct, and as soon as he arrived was committed prisoner to the tower. Sitters was well received at Whitehall, and had a long audience. He could, with more truth than diplomatists on such occasions think at all necessary, disclaim, on the part of the States-General, any hostile project. For the States-General had, as yet, no official knowledge of the design of William, nor was it by any means impossible that they might even now refuse to sanction that design. James declared that he gave not the least credit to the rumours of a Dutch invasion, and that the conduct of the French government had surprised and annoyed him. Middleton was directed to assure all the foreign ministers that there existed no such alliance between France and England as the court of Versailles had, for its own ends, pretended. To the nuncio the king said that the designs of Louis were palpable and should be frustrated. This officious protection was at once an insult and a snare. "'My good brother,' said James, "'has excellent qualities, but flattery and vanity have turned his head.' Ada who was much more anxious about Cologne than about England, encouraged this strange delusion. Albeville, who had now returned to his post, was commanded to give friendly assurances to the States-General, and to add some high language, which might have been becoming in the mouth of Elizabeth or Oliver. "'My master,' he said, "'is raised alike by his power and by his spirit, above the position which France affects to assign to him. There is some difference between a king of England and an archbishop of Cologne.' The reception of Bon Repos at Whitehall was cold. The naval succours which he offered were not absolutely declined, but he was forced to return without having settled anything, and the envoys, both of the United Provinces and of the House of Austria, were informed that his mission had been disagreeable to the King, and had produced no result. After the revolution Sunderland boasted, and probably with truth, that he had induced his master to reject the proffered assistance of France. The perverse folly of James naturally excited the indignation of his powerful neighbour. Lewis complained that, in return for the greatest service which he could render to the English government, that government had given him the lie in the face of all Christendom. He justly remarked that what Avaux had said, touching the alliance between France and Great Britain, was true according to the spirit, though perhaps not according to the letter. There was not indeed a treaty digested into articles, signed, sealed, and ratified, but assurances equivalent in the estimation of honourable men to such a treaty had, during some years, been constantly exchanged between the two courts. Lewis added that, high as was his own place in Europe, he should never be so absurdly jealous of his dignity as to see an insult in any act prompted by friendship. But James was in a very different situation, and would soon learn the value of that aid which he had so ungraciously rejected. Yet, Notwithstanding the stupidity and ingratitude of James, it would have been wise in Lewis to persist in the resolution which had been notified to the States-General. Avaux, whose sagacity and judgment made him an antagonist worthy of William, was decidedly of this opinion. The first object of the French government, so the skilful envoy reasoned, ought to be to prevent the intended descent on England. The way to prevent that descent was to invade the Spanish Netherlands and to menace the Batavian frontier. The Prince of Orange, indeed, was so bent on his darling enterprise that he would persist, even if the white flag were flying on the walls of Brussels. He had actually said that, if the Spaniards could only manage to keep Ostend, Mons, and Namur till the next spring, he would then return from England with a force which would soon recover all that had been lost. But though such was the Prince's opinion, it was not the opinion of the States they would not readily consent to send their captain-general and the flower of their army across the German Ocean, while a formidable enemy threatened their own territory. Lewis admitted the force of these reasonings, 
but he had already resolved on a different line of action. Perhaps he had been provoked by the discourtesy and wrong-headedness of the English government, and indulged his temper at the expense of his interest. Perhaps he was misled by the counsels of his ministers of war. Louvois, whose influence was great, and who regarded Avaux with no friendly feeling. It was determined to strike in a quarter remote from Holland a great and unexpected blow. Louis suddenly withdrew his troops from Flanders, and poured them into Germany. One army, placed under the nominal command of the Dauphin, but really directed by the Duke of Duras and by Vauban, the father of the science of fortification, invested Philipsburg. Another, led by the Marquess of Beaufleurs, seized Worms, Mentz, and Treves. A third, commanded by the Marquess of Humieres, entered Bonn. All down the Rhine, from Karlsruhe to Cologne, the French arms were victorious. The news of the fall of Philipsburg reached Versailles on All Saints' Day, while the court was listening to a sermon in the chapel. The king made a sign to the preacher to stop, announced the good news to the congregation, and kneeling down returned thanks to God for this great success. The audience wept for joy. The tidings were eagerly welcomed by the sanguine and susceptible people of France. Poets celebrated the triumphs of their magnificent patron. Orators extolled from the pulpit the wisdom and magnanimity of the eldest son of the church. The Te Deum was sung with unwonted pomp, and the solemn notes of the organ were mingled with the clash of the cymbal and the blast of the trumpet. But there was little cause for rejoicing. The great statesman, who was at the head of the European coalition, smiled inwardly at the misdirected energy of his foe. Lewis had, indeed, by his promptitude, gained some advantages on the side of Germany, but those advantages would avail little if England, inactive and inglorious under four successive kings, should suddenly resume her old rank in Europe. A few weeks would suffice for the enterprise on which the fate of the world depended, and for a few weeks the United Provinces were in security. William now urged on his preparations with indefatigable activity, and with less secrecy than he had hitherto thought necessary. Assurances of support came pouring in daily from foreign courts. Opposition had become extinct at the Hague. It was in vain that Avaux, even at this last moment, exerted all his skill to reanimate the faction which had contended against three generations of the House of Orange. The chiefs of that faction, indeed, still regarded the Stadtholder with no friendly feeling. They had reason to fear that, if he prospered in England, he would become absolute master of Holland. Nevertheless, the errors of the court of Versailles, and the dexterity with which he had availed himself of those errors, made it impossible to continue the struggle against him. He saw that the time had come for demanding the sanction of the States. Amsterdam was the headquarters of the party hostile to his line, his office, and his person, and even from Amsterdam he had at this moment nothing to apprehend. Some of the chief functionaries of that city had been repeatedly closeted with him, with Dickfeld, and with Bentinck, and had been induced to promise that they would promote, or at least they would not oppose, the great design. Some were exasperated by the commercial edicts of Lewis. Some were in deep distress for kinsmen and friends who were harassed by the French dragoons. Some shrank from the responsibility of causing a schism which might be fatal to the Batavian Federation. And some were afraid of the common people who, stimulated by the exhortations of zealous preachers, were ready to execute summary justice on any traitor to the Protestant cause. The majority, therefore, of that town council which had long been devoted to France, pronounced in favour of William's undertaking. Thenceforth, all fear of opposition in any part of the United Provinces was at an end, and the full sanction of the Federation to his enterprise was, in secret sittings, formally given. The prince had already fixed upon a general well qualified to be second in command. This was indeed no light matter. A random shot, or the dagger of an assassin, might in a moment leave the expedition without a head. It was necessary that a successor should be ready to fill the vacant place. Yet it was impossible to make choice of any Englishman without giving offence either to the Whigs or to the Tories. Nor had any Englishman then living shown that he possessed the military skill necessary for the conduct of a campaign. On the other hand, it was not easy to assign preeminence to a foreigner without wounding the national sensibility of the haughty islanders. One man there was, and only one in Europe, to whom no objection could be found. Frederick, Count of Schomberg, a German, sprung from a noble house of the Palatinate. 
he was generally esteemed the greatest living master of the art of war. His rectitude and piety, tried by strong temptations and never found wanting, commanded general respect and confidence. Though a Protestant, he had been through many years in the service of Lewis, and had in spite of the ill offices of the Jesuits, extorted from his employer by a series of great actions, the staff of a marshal from France. When persecution began to rage, the brave veteran steadfastly refused to purchase the royal favour by apostasy, resigned without one murmur all his honours and commands, quitted his adopted country for ever, and took refuge at the court of Berlin. He had passed his seventieth year, but both his mind and his body were still in full vigour. He had been in England, and was much loved and honoured there. He had indeed a recommendation of which very few foreigners could then boast, for he spoke our language, not only intelligibly, but with grace and purity. He was, with the consent of the Elector of Brandenburg, and with the warm approbation of the chiefs of all English parties, appointed William's lieutenant. End of Part 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. History of England, from the accession of James II, by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 9, Part 11. And now the Hague was crowded with British adventurers of all the various parties which the tyranny of James had united in a strange coalition. Old royalists who had shed their blood for the throne, old agitators of the army of the Parliament, Tories who had been persecuted in the days of the Exclusion Bill, Whigs who had fled to the Continent for their share in the Rye House plot. Conspicuous in this great assemblage were Charles Gerard, Earl of Macclesfield, an ancient cavalier who had fought for Charles I and had shared the exile of Charles II, Archibald Campbell, who was the eldest son of the unfortunate Argyle, but had inherited nothing except an illustrious name and the inalienable affection of a numerous clan, Charles Paulet, Earl of Wiltshire, heir apparent of the Marquisate of Winchester, and Peregrine Osborne, Lord Dumblane, heir apparent of the earldom of Danby. Mordaunt, exulting in the prospect of ventures irresistibly attractive to his fiery nature, was among the foremost volunteers. Fletcher of Saltoon had learned, while guarding the frontier of Christendom against the infidels, that there was once more a hope of deliverance for his country, and had hastened to offer the help of his sword. Sir Patrick Hume, who had, since his flight from Scotland, lived humbly at Utrecht, now emerged from his obscurity, but, fortunately, his eloquence could, on this occasion, do little mischief for the Prince of Orange was by no means disposed to be the lieutenant of a debating society such as that which had ruined the enterprise of Argyle. The subtle and restless wildman, who had some time before found England an unsafe residence, and had retired to Germany, now repaired from Germany to the Prince's court. There too was Carstairs, a Presbyterian minister from Scotland, who in craft and courage had no superior among the politicians of his age. He had been entrusted some years before by Fagel with important secrets, and had resolutely kept them in spite of the most horrible torments which could be inflicted by boot and thumbscrew. His rare fortitude had earned for him as large a share of the prince's confidence and esteem as was granted to any man except Bentinck. Ferguson could not remain quiet when a revolution was preparing. He secured for himself a passage in the fleet, and made himself busy among his fellow emigrants. But he found himself generally distrusted and despised. He had been a great man in the knot of ignorant and hot-headed outlaws who had urged the feeble Monmouth to destruction. But there was no place for a low-minded agitator, half-maniac and half-knave, among the grave statesmen and generals who partook the cares of the resolute and sagacious William. The difference between the expedition of 1685 and the expedition of 1688 was sufficiently marked by the difference between the manifestos which the leaders of those expeditions published. 
for Monmouth Ferguson had scribbled an absurd and brutal libel about the burning of London, the strangling of Godfrey, the butchering of Essex, and the poisoning of Charles. The declaration of William was drawn up by the grand pensionary Fagel, who was highly renowned as a publicist. Though weighty and learned, it was, in its original form, much too prolix, but it was abridged and translated into English by Burnett, who well understood the art of popular composition. It began by a solemn preamble, setting forth that, in every community, the strict observance of the law was necessary alike to the happiness of nations and to the security of governments. The Prince of Orange had therefore seen with deep concern that the fundamental laws of a kingdom, with which he was by blood and by marriage closely connected, had, by the advice of evil counsellors, been grossly and systematically violated. The power of dispensing with acts of Parliament had been strained to such a point that the whole legislative authority had been transferred to the Crown. Decisions at variance with the spirit of the Constitution had been obtained from the tribunals by turning out judge after judge, till the bench had been filled with men ready to obey implicitly the directions of the government. Notwithstanding the King's repeated assurances that he would maintain the established religion, persons notoriously hostile to that religion had been promoted not only to civil offices, but also to ecclesiastical benefices. The government of the Church had, in defiance of express statutes, been entrusted to a new court of high commission, and in that court one avowed papist had a seat. Good subjects, for refusing to violate their duty and their oaths, had been ejected from their property, in contempt of the great charter of the liberties of England. Meanwhile, persons who could not legally set foot on the island had been placed at the head of seminaries for the corruption of youth. Lieutenants, deputy lieutenants, justices of the peace, had been dismissed in multitudes for refusing to support a pernicious and unconstitutional policy. The franchises of almost every borough in the realm had been invaded. The courts of justice were in such a state that their decisions, even in civil matters, had ceased to inspire confidence, and that their servility in criminal cases had brought on the kingdom the stain of innocent blood. All these abuses, loathed by the English nation, were to be defended, it seemed, by an army of Irish papists. Nor was this all. The most arbitrary princes had never accounted it an offence in a subject modestly and peaceably to represent his grievances and to ask for relief. But supplication was now treated as a high misdemeanor in England, for no crime but that of offering to the sovereign a petition drawn up in the most respectful terms, the fathers of the church had been imprisoned and prosecuted, and every judge who gave his voice in their favor had instantly been turned out. The calling of a free and lawful Parliament might indeed be an effectual remedy for all these evils. But such a Parliament, unless the whole spirit of the administration were changed, the nation could not hope to see. It was evidently the intention of the Court to bring together, by means of regulated corporations and of popish returning officers, a body which would be a House of Commons in name alone. Lastly, there were circumstances which raised a grave suspicion that the child who was called Prince of Wales was not really born of the Queen. For these reasons, the Prince, mindful of his near relation to the royal house, and grateful for the affection which the English people had ever shown to his beloved wife and to himself, had resolved, in compliance with the request of many lords spiritual and temporal, and of many other persons of all ranks, to go over at the head of a force sufficient to repel violence. He abjured all thought of conquest. He protested that, while his troops remained in the island, they should be kept under the strictest restraints of discipline, and that, as soon as the nation had been delivered from tyranny, they should be sent back. His single object was to have a free and legal Parliament assembled, and to the decision of such a Parliament he solemnly pledged himself to leave all questions, both public and private. As soon as copies of this declaration were banded about The Hague, signs of dissension began to appear among the English. Wildman, indefatigable in mischief, prevailed on some of his countrymen, and among others, on the headstrong and volatile Mordaunt, 
to declare that they would not take up arms on such grounds. The paper had been drawn up merely to please the Cavaliers and the Parsons. The injuries of the Church and the trial of the bishops had been put too prominently forward, and nothing had been said of the tyrannical manner in which the Tories, before their rupture with the court, had treated the Whigs. Wildman then brought forward a counter-project, prepared by himself, which, if it had been adopted, would have disgusted all the Anglican clergy and four-fifths of the landed aristocracy. The leading Whigs strongly opposed him. Russell in particular declared that, if such an insane course were taken, there would be an end of the coalition from which alone the nation could expect deliverance. The dispute was at length settled by the authority of William, who, with his usual good sense, determined that the manifesto should stand nearly as Fagel and Burnett had framed it. While these things were passing in Holland, James had at length become sensible of his danger. Intelligence which could not be disregarded came pouring in from various quarters. At length, a despatch from Albeville removed all doubts. It is said that, when the king had read it, the blood left his cheeks, and he remained sometimes speechless. He might indeed well be appalled. The first easterly wind would bring a hostile armament to the shores of his realm. All Europe, one single power alone excepted, was impatiently waiting for the news of his downfall. The help of that single power he had madly rejected, nay, he had requited with insult the friendly intervention which might have saved him. The French armies, which, but for his own folly, might have been employed in overawing the States-General, were besieging Philipsburg or garrisoning Mentz. In a few days he might have to fight, on English ground, for his crown and for the birthright of his infant son. His means were indeed in appearance great. The navy was in a much more efficient state than at the time of his accession, and the improvement is partly to be attributed to his own exertions. He had appointed no Lord High Admiral or Boards of Admiralty, but had kept the chief direction of maritime affairs in his own hands, and had been strenuously assisted by Pepys. It is a proverb that the eye of a master is more to be trusted than that of a deputy, and, in an age of corruption and peculation, a department on which a sovereign, even of very slender capacity, bestows close personal attention, is likely to be comparatively free from abuses. It would have been easy to find an abler minister of marine than James, but it would not have been easy to find, among the public men of that age, any minister of marine except James, who would not have embezzled stores, taken bribes from contractors, and charged the crown with the cost of repairs which had never been made. The king was, in truth, almost the only person who could be trusted not to rob the king. There had therefore been, during the last three years, much less waste and pilfering in the dockyards than formerly. Ships had been built which were fit to go to sea. An excellent order had been issued, increasing the allowances of captains, and at the same time strictly forbidding them to carry merchandise from port to port without the royal permission. The effect of these reforms was already perceptible, and James found no difficulty in fitting out, at short notice, a considerable fleet. Thirty ships of the line, all third rates and fourth rates, were collected in the Thames, under the command of Lord Dartmouth. The loyalty of Dartmouth was above suspicion, and he was thought to have as much professional skill and knowledge as any of the patrician sailors who, in that age, rose to the highest naval commands without a regular naval training, and who were at once flag officers on the sea and colonels of infantry on shore. The regular army was the largest that any king of England had ever commanded, and was rapidly augmented. New companies were incorporated with the existing regiments. Commissions for the raising of fresh regiments were issued. Four thousand men were added to the English establishment. Three thousand were sent for with all speed from Ireland. As many more were ordered to march southward from Scotland. James estimated the force with which he should be able to meet the invaders at near forty thousand troops, exclusive of the militia. The navy and army were therefore far more than sufficient to repel a Dutch invasion. But could the navy, could the army, be trusted? 
Would not the train bands flock by thousands to the standard of the deliverer? The party which had, a few years before, drawn the sword for Monmouth, would undoubtedly be eager to welcome the Prince of Orange. And what had become of the party which had, during seven and forty years, been the bulwark of monarchy? Where were now those gallant gentlemen who had ever been ready to shed their blood for the crown? Outraged and insulted, driven from the bench of justice, and deprived of all military command, they saw the peril of their ungrateful sovereign with undisguised delight. Where were those priests and prelates who had, from ten thousand pulpits, proclaimed the duty of obeying the anointed delegate of God? Some of them had been imprisoned, some had been plundered, all had been placed under the iron rule of the High Commission, and had been in hourly fear lest some new freak of tyranny should deprive them of their freeholds, and leave them without a morsel of bread. That churchmen would even now so completely forget the doctrine which had been their peculiar boast as to join in active resistance seemed incredible. But could their oppressor expect to find among them the spirit which in the preceding generation had triumphed over the armies of Essex and Waller, and had yielded only after a desperate struggle to the genius and vigor of Cromwell? The tyrant was overcome by fear. He ceased to repeat that concession had always ruined princes, and sullenly owned that he must stoop to court the Tories once more. There is reason to believe that Halifax was, at this time, invited to return to office, and that he was not unwilling to do so. The part of mediator between the throne and the nation was, of all parts, that for which he was best qualified, and of which he was most ambitious. How the negotiation with him was broken off is not known, but it is not improbable that the question of the dispensing power was the insurmountable difficulty. His hostility to that power had caused his disgrace three years before, and nothing that had since happened had been of a nature to change his views. James, on the other hand, was fully determined to make no concession on that point. As to other matters, he was less pertinacious. He put forth a proclamation in which he solemnly promised to protect the Church of England and to maintain the Act of Uniformity. He declared himself willing to make great sacrifices for the sake of Concord. He would no longer insist that Roman Catholics should be admitted into the House of Commons, and he trusted that his people would justly appreciate such a proof of his disposition to meet their wishes. Three days later, he notified his intention to replace all the magistrates and deputy lieutenants who had been dismissed for refusing to support his policy. On the day after the appearance of this notification, Compton's suspension was taken off. At the same time, the King gave an audience to all the bishops who were then in London. They had requested admittance to his presence for the purpose of tendering their counsel in this emergency. The primate was spokesman. He respectfully asked that the administration might be put into the hands of persons duly qualified, that all acts done under pretense of the dispensing power might be revoked, that the ecclesiastical commission might be annulled, that the wrongs of Magdalen College might be redressed, and that the old franchises of the municipal corporations might be restored. He hinted very intelligibly that there was one most desirable event which would completely secure the throne and quiet the distracted realm. If His Majesty would reconsider the points in dispute between the churches of Rome and England, perhaps, by the divine blessing on the arguments which the bishops wished to lay before him, he might be convinced that it was his duty to return to the religion of his father and of his grandfather. Thus far, Sancroft said, he had spoken the sense of his brethren— there remained a subject on which he had not taken counsel with them, but to which he thought it his duty to advert. He was indeed the only man of his profession who could advert to that subject without being suspected of an interested motive. The Metropolitan See of York had been three years vacant. The Archbishop implored the King to fill it speedily with a pious and learned divine, and added that such a divine might without difficulty be found among those who then stood in the royal presence. The king commanded himself sufficiently to return thanks for this unpalatable counsel, and promised to consider what had been said. 
of the dispensing power he would not yield one tittle. No unqualified person was removed from any civil or military office, but some of Sancroft's suggestions were adopted. Within forty-eight hours the Court of High Commission was abolished. It was determined that the charter of the City of London, which had been forfeited six years before, should be restored, and the Chancellor was sent in state to carry back the venerable parchment to Guildhall. A week later the public was informed that the Bishop of Winchester, who was by virtue of his office visitor of Magdalen College, had it in charge from the King to correct whatever was amiss in that society. It was not without a long struggle and a bitter pang that James stooped to this last humiliation. Indeed, he did not yield to the vicar Apostolic Leyburn, who seems to have behaved on all occasions like a wise and honest man, declared that in his judgment the ejected president and fellows had been wronged, and that on religious as well as on political grounds restitution ought to be made to them. In a few days appeared a proclamation restoring the forfeited franchises of all the municipal corporations. James flattered himself that concessions so great, made in the short space of a month, would bring back to him the hearts of his people. Nor can it be doubted that such concessions, made before there was reason to expect an invasion from Holland, would have done much to conciliate the Tories. But gratitude is not to be expected by rulers who give to fear what they have refused to justice. During three years the king had been proof to all argument and to all entreaty. Every minister who had dared to raise his voice in favor of the civil and ecclesiastical constitution of the realm had been disgraced. A parliament eminently loyal had ventured to protest gently and respectfully against the violation of the fundamental laws of England, and had been sternly reprimanded, prorogued, and dissolved. Judge after judge had been stripped of the ermine for declining to give decisions opposed to the whole common and statute law. The most respectable cavaliers had been excluded from all share in the government of their counties for refusing to betray the public liberties. Scores of clergymen had been deprived of their livelihood for observing their oaths. Prelates, to whose steadfast fidelity the king owed the crown which he wore, had on their knees besought him not to command them to violate the laws of God and of the land. Their modest petition had been treated as a seditious libel. They had been brown-beaten, threatened, imprisoned, prosecuted, and had narrowly escaped utter ruin. Then, at length, the nation, finding that right was borne down by might, and that even supplication was regarded as a crime, began to think of trying the chances of war. The oppressor learned that an armed deliverer was at hand, and would be eagerly welcomed by Whigs and Tories, dissenters and churchmen. All was immediately changed. That government which had requited constant and zealous service with spoliation and persecution, that government which, to weighty reasons and pathetic entreaties, had replied only by injuries and insults, became in a moment strangely gracious. Every gazette now announced the removal of some grievance, it was then evident that on the equity, the humanity, the plighted word of the king, no reliance could be placed, and that he would govern well only so long as he was under the strong dread of resistance. His subjects were therefore by no means disposed to restore him a confidence which he had justly forfeited, or to relax the pressure which had wrung from him the only good acts of his whole reign. The general impatience for the arrival of the Dutch became every day stronger. The gales which at this time blew obstinately from the west, and which at once prevented the prince's armament from sailing, and brought fresh Irish regiments from Dublin to Chester, were bitterly cursed and reviled by the common people. The weather, it was said, was popish. Crowds stood in Cheapside gazing intently at the weathercock on the graceful steeple of Bow Church, and praying for a Protestant wind. End of Part 11